So now we're going to talk about gastrointestinal tract diseases caused by microorganisms. These include dental caries, mumps, gastritis, acute diarrhea, diarrhea caused by toxins, and hepatitis. So starting with dental caries. So dental caries are cavities. If you've ever had a cavity, that is what a dental carry is. So the most common infectious disease of human beings is cavities. Dissolution of the tooth surface due to metabolic actions of bacteria. It results in minor to complete disruption of the enamel. And the most common causes of dental caries includes strep mutans and strep sabrinus. Incidence varies according to carbohydrate consumption, oral hygiene, and genetic factors. So there are, is a genetic component to this, and the genetic component, component is the integrity of the enamel. But with the bacteria, the bacteria start to produce an acid while they metabolize food in the area. And through acid production, they're going to start actually like corroding away the enamel. And eventually that can cause a hole to form and you can crack the tooth open down to the root and then you end up getting, um, having to lose the tooth and it can become pretty serious. The thing that people don't realize about cavities and about the type of bacteria that live in the mouth that cause the cavities, a lot of this bacteria, especially if the patient has something else like gingivitis or um, some advanced form of like a necrotizing gum disease, the bacteria from the mouth can readily spread to other parts of the body, especially in the heart. So people that have infections in the teeth likely also develop secondary infections in other parts of the body, and it can make them very sick. Not only in people, but especially in animals. Because people have the tendency to go to the dentist, but we don't always think about the oral hygiene of our pets, and pets can get really sick from the bacteria that's shedding from their teeth. As far as the um, carbohydrate consumption, so we're talking about sugar in the mouth. So the more sugar that stays on the teeth, the more you're feeding these bacteria. So having a low sugar intake diet is going to really help prevent against these dental caries. That's why they say, you know, kids shouldn't eat as much candy because the sugar that they're eating with their teeth is actually feeding the bacteria. And when the bacteria eat the sugar that's coming in from your mouth, they're going to metabolize it, produce an acid, and deposit the acid on your teeth. So after you consume a lot of sugar, you should always try to brush your teeth. So the next one is mumps. So we talk about mumps here. Mumps is really like a respiratory kind of mixed infection and you get like cold-like symptoms with this, but it specifically infects the salivary glands and the salivary glands are a major component of your digestive tract, so we talk about mumps here. So mumps is caused by the mumps virus. It's covered under the MMR vaccines, so measles, mumps, and rubella. You get nasal discharge, muscle pain, malaise, Inflammation of the salivary glands, so if you remember the where the salivary glands are located, we're talking specifically about the parotid salivary glands, which are located in the cheeks, kind of over the masseter muscle that helps you chew. So you get gopher-like swelling of the cheeks. They can invade other organs like the testes, ovaries, pancreas, meninges, heart, and kidneys, causing swelling of those organs. In 20 to 30 percent of young adult males, the virus locali localizes in the epididymis and testes, but does not cause sterility. So this is what a child looks like with mumps. You just give supportive care for this one. There is an MMR vaccine for prevention, but mumps usually subsides on its own. It's just something to watch. Mumps is a quarantinable disease, so if somebody presents with mumps, they get quarantined and a lot of questions get asked about where they've been and who they've been in contact with. With the rise in the anti-vaccine movement, there have been many more and there probably will increase to be a lot more cases of mumps in the United States. So this is a table that you can review that comes straight from the um, textbook. So gastritis and gastric ulcers. So gastritis is a sharp or burning pain emanating from the abdomen. Oftentimes the patient will come in saying that they have epigastric pain. So if you remember your nine abdominal regions, it's the region um, kind of right below the heart, right in the abdomen. 
and this pain may irradiate through to the back. It may cause them to have so much pain that they feel like vomiting. Gastric or pep peptic ulcers are lesions on the stomach or uppermost portion of the small intestine. And with these ulcers, the most common causative agent is Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori infects half of the world's population, and in half the world's population, or in most of these people that it's infecting, it is asymptomatic, and people don't realize that they have it. But when it becomes asymp it, when it becomes symptomatic, and they start to develop pain from this, there's a couple different tests that you can do for H. pylori. One of them is a biopsy. So they actually take an endoscope and go into the, um, through the mouth and into the stomach and they snip a little biopsy out of the stomach tissue. From there, they can either culture it and if the microorganism still grows at a very high incubation temperature, you can kind of assume that it's Helicobacter pylori. So they'll crank up the incubator to like 45 degrees Celsius and if it still has growth, then it's positive for that. A less invasive test would be swallowing um, radioactive urea, so it's the urea breath test. The microorganism is going to be able to metabolize the urea using the enzyme urease. Whereas the microorganism consumes the urea, it releases carbon dioxide as a waste product. Now the carbon that's in the radioactive urea has been radioactively labeled. So as the patient consumes this radioactive urea, the microorganisms in the stomach will break it apart and release the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is going to travel back up out the patient's mouth and then it's detected by this radioactive detector. So the patient breathes out into this machine and if the radioactive carbon dioxide comes back out, then we know that there's something inside of the stomach that is breaking down this urea and it's likely to be Helicobacter pylori because this is one of the microorganisms that lives in the stomach and that can produce that urease. Usually treated with a combination of amoxicillin followed by um, a couple other drugs. So this is a picture and you've got this scope that you can see. So the patient is usually put in a twilight or kind of half unconscious for this procedure and you put the scope all the way down into their throat, into their stomach, and then you look around in the stomach to see if there's any ulcer regions. And then if um, you can also get into the upper part of the small intestine, particularly the duodenum that's shown here, and you look for that peptic region and or that ulceric region, and then you take a little biopsy and you can snip that and bring that out for culture. We don't know how this is transmitted. So today we don't know how it's transmitted. We know its major virulence factors include um, adhesions and urease. Prevention, you can't really do much to prevent it. Treatment is with antibiotics. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about diarrhea. So acute diarrhea with or without vomiting Diarrhea is defined as three or more loose stools in a 24-hour period. In the United States, an average of 1.2 to 1.9 cases per person per year. A third are transmitted by contaminated food. In tropical countries, children experience 10 episodes per year. More than 3 million children die of diarrhea per year, mostly in developing countries. So if we look at what is causing the diarrhea, Everybody always blames E. coli for everything. E. coli is not even one of the top ones. So if we look at this list here, Campylobacter is a majority of the cases. And then we have Salmonella, Clostridium perfringens, and the norovirus. Without vomiting, this is kind of the breakdown. So we have Toxoplasma, Salmonella, and norovirus. So the first one we're gonna talk about is Salmonella. Signs and symptoms, so 1.2 million cases and 500 deaths each year are due to salmonella. It's called the enteric fever, and you can also develop gastroenteritis from this. So it can range from mild diarrhea to fever and septicemia, depending on where the microorganism travels. If the microorganism stays in the digestive tract, then you're likely just going to have the gastroenteritis. So you are going to have the fever, but your symptoms are predominantly going to be 
diarrhea, vomiting. Um, there may be blood in the stool, but it's mainly going to be a GI um, symptom. If the microorganism goes through the blood and starts replicating in the blood and stays in the blood, then you're going to develop typhoid fever. So typhoid fever is progressive, invasive infection that eventually leads to septicemia characterized by fever, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. So at this point, the patient has a high risk of death. The ability to cause disease is dependent on its ability to adhere to the gut mucosa. This is different per person, so everybody has different um, surfaces inside of their intestines, different microbiota, like the good guys that are colonizing there, so it's really dependent on a case-by-case -case basis. This does have a high ID. So ID50, we talk about the infectious dose, how many organisms you need to consume in order to get an infection. So we're talking about 100,000 to a million microorganisms have to be consumed before a person would get infected with this. So here you can see the number of cases of typhoid fever and then the number of cases of other salmonelloses. So typhoid fever cases have seriously declined to almost non-existent, while salmonella or salmonelloses cases or the gastrointestinal cases, this increases. And in 1985, there was an epidemic due to contaminated milk in the Midwest. So there was a huge epidemic, a huge spike in cases, and then we kind of leveled off again. So something that I do want to mention before we go on to Shigella. With salmonella, there's a couple different causes. Like If you think about what causes salmonella, most people say eggs. So they think they get salmonella from eggs, and that's true. Birds are carriers for salmonella. But what birds are carrying salmonella is usually on the surface of the egg. The egg on the inside is always thought to be a sterile environment. So if you clean the outside of the egg and wash the outside of the egg, the salmonella is actually in the feces of the bird, which as, if you know anything about avian anatomy down there, they have one hole. And that one hole is the opening for the rest, or the reproductive tract, the digestive tract, and the urinary system. So all three of those major organ systems kind of funnel into this one hole called the cloaca, and then the egg will pass through the vent, um, which is kind of similar to the anus. So the cloaca is similar to our rectum, the vent is similar to the anus. So as the feces or the fecal matter from the bird mixes with the outer shell of the egg, that is the number one way that our food gets contaminated. Now if we wash these eggs appropriately and scrub the surface of the eggs, then the eggs are generally considered safe and we can crack them open and eat them and we're not necessarily going to get salmonella from them. But another major carrier for salmonella is reptiles. And it may be a different species. There's a species called Salmonella arizoniae that naturally lives on top of reptiles. The reason why I remember that name is because Arizona, I think of a lot of reptiles in Arizona, so uh, Salmonella arizoniae is uh, the species that you'd find on reptiles. So if you have pet turtles or lizards or snakes of some sort at home, pet alligators, because I know everybody in here has one of those, uh, <laughs> so they carry this, and if you let your kids touch those animals and then put their hands in their mouth, they're likely to get sick. And with that type of salmonella, they're not going to typically end up with any type of typhoid fever. They're going to end up with the gastrointestinal symptoms and the diarrhea, which is usually self-limited and doesn't require treatment. So the next one is Shigella. Shigella is very similar to E. coli. It's a gram-negative, straight rods, non-modile, non-endospore forming. There is um, Shigella dysenteriae, which is the most severe form. And then there's a couple other Shigella species that causes 20,000 to 25,000 cases per year. Half of those are in children. Symptoms include frequent watery stools and intestinal intense abdominal pain. And dysentery, dysentery means that the di diarrhea contains blood. Pathogenesis and virulence factors, so it invades the villus cells of the large intestine, but does not per perforate the intestine or invade the blood. The release of the endotoxin causes fever. 
The enterotoxin affects the entire GI tract, damages the mucosa and the villi, and gives rise to bleeding and secretion of mucus. The shigatoxin is responsible for more serious damage to the intestine as well as systemic effects. So this shows a picture of a healthy GI tract, and this shows a picture of a Shigella infection. The other thing about Shigella is it has a relatively low ID or infectious dose. So you only need about 10,000 cells to get a full-blown Shigella infection. Now that Shiga toxin that we talked about with Shigella is also produced by certain types of E. coli. E. coli 0157 is a Shiga toxin producing E. coli. So the symptoms of this one range from mild gastroenteritis to fever with bloody diarrhea, and then some patients go on to develop hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is severe hemolytic anemia that can cause kidney damage and kidney failure. Toxins are identical to Shiga toxins produced by Shigella. So you've got an entirely different species. You've got Shigella. And that Shigella produces a Shiga toxin. And then you have an entirely different species, E. coli. And E. coli also produces the exact same um, toxin. And this toxin causes all sorts of very terrible symptoms. Any diagnosis of E. coli 0157 is immediately reported to the state. The state health departments need to know about this to make sure that it's not a foodborne issue. If we look at this table here, and this table is a little bit outdated, but even though the dates are a little bit old, these really still hold true. The biggest bar you see here is ground beef. So I'm going to go into a little bit of meat production with you. My first semester at UW-Madison, I wanted to be a veterinarian, so my major was animal sciences. And with an animal sciences major, they give you the option to take you know, all these different courses, but what is not optional is taking a livestock production class. So you need to learn about livestock production. Now me, going into this, I'm like, oh, we're going to learn how to take care of you know, cows and um, horses and pigs and you know other types of animals that live on the farm. Well I was very wrong. Livestock production is how to raise and slaughter animals. So my first lab at UW-Madison we ended up having to slaughter a cow, a pig, a sheep, and a chicken. Now they walked us through all the processes of doing this and I was absolutely mortified because I got into the business in order to help animals not to sit here and learn about how to kill them. So this was terrible for me, but I learned something through the process. When you slaughter an animal, you usually um, knock them unconscious, and then after they're unconscious, you have to drain their blood while the heart's still beating, so there's a process involved with there, and I'm not going to go through the details because I know some people are really sensitive to this topic. But what is relevant to the class is how they process the digestive tract of the animal. So they hang the animal upside down and then they carefully cut around the anus in a perfect circle and then they will tie off that area and in one fail swoop they will eviscerate the animal. So they'll cut open the belly of the animal and then they'll kind of let that rectum that they've tied drop out of the animal and onto the floor. That is the most important part of doing this um, livestock production or of harvesting meat from an animal. You need to get all of that bacteria from the inside of the digestive tract safely away from any of the meat. If the intestine or any part of that digestive tract perforates during the process, now you've contaminated the entire animal carcass and that needs excessive treatment to make sure that it's safe for human consumption. Ground beef is going to be what's left after all of the major cuts of meat have been taken away. So they'll cut out all of the steaks, they'll cut out the, the ribs and everything, and then what's left is ground beef. It's ground into the remaining meat. So that includes all of the face meat, all of the tendons and ligaments. If you've ever looked at ground beef, you may see like these shiny little white flecks. That's what all of those tendons and ligaments are. So everything that's remaining on the animal gets ground up, and that's what ground beef is this is the most likely to be contaminated with anything that may have spilled out of the perforated intestine. It's also the trickiest to treat because it's ground up and you can mix in the bacteria really well with that ground beef. 
So ground beef should never be consumed pink. People that go to restaurants and order like medium well or medium hamburgers, they are crazy. <laughs> the people that um, actually eat ground beef pate, like straight up just eat ground beef, that's a serious risk, a major health risk. The other thing you see here is the produce. So the next biggest bars would be produce. What people do with produce is sometimes they will spread animal feces on their produce. And the animal feces is good because it serves as a rich source of nutrients. But one of the major problems of using animal feces and spreading that all over your um, produce that you're going to eat is the fact that that animal feces has bacteria from the animal in it. When you spread it out thin enough over a field, likely the UV radiation will destroy most of that, like most of those microorganisms. But a lot of times those microorganisms can stay behind on the meat and then it can contaminate, or sorry, not behind on the meat, behind on the produce and then they contaminate the produce and you're consuming that and that's how you end up getting sick. Another thing that can happen is some people choose to fertilize their produce with human feces, which is really out there and crazy and you are seriously posing a risk to human health by doing that practice. But when you travel to other parts of the world and they don't have the clean water sources that we have here in the United States, they wash your produce and serve up a lettuce or a salad for you and then you end up eating that and even though the produce may not have been fertilized with human or animal feces, even though it was treated properly and they washed it, they're washing it with contaminated water. So that's how people end up getting sick as well. So there's a lot of different ways that people can get sick. Any sign of E. coli 0157 though, again, like I said, has to be reported just because of how severely damaging this one can be. Unlike Shig uh, Shigella, this type of E. coli does perforate the intestine. And once it drills its holes through your intestine, it starts to migrate to other organs and it will cause multi-organ failure and it will kill somebody in a pretty quick period of time after the perforation happens. So this one is definitely reportable and it's seriously dangerous. One last thing that I just want to mention about the um, production here. There's parts of the world that field dress animals. So whether you're a hunter in, the, in Wisconsin and you go shoot a deer and then you like cut the intestines out of the animal, or some people up in Anchorage, um, if you hit a moose in Anchorage, it's the law that they have to give you 30 minutes to field dress the dead animal. So after the animal's been killed, you got 30 minutes to go out into the field and eviscerate, clean up the animal, and then take the moose meat home. And they recently did a study of um, the meat that's coming out of field dressings and how contaminated it is with all these different types of microorganisms. But most alarmingly is every single type of um, sample that they got, whether it was a fecal sample or an actual meat sample, contained antibiotic resistant bacteria. And it's part of their culture to just eat this meat. And they cook it, but if it's not cooked thoroughly, you can just imagine how they're eating something that's like um, resistant to one of the most common antibiotics, colistin, which is used to kill the um, a lot of different types of enteric pathogens. So they're practicing this. This is part of their you know heritage, something that they do, and they're posing a major risk because in this study, I mean, all of them were resistant to antibiotics. So that's pretty insane. Okay, moving on to Campylobacter. So this one is the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea in the United States. Again, we always think it's E. coli, it's actually Campylobacter. So frequent watery stools, fever, vomiting, headaches, and severe abdominal pain. Symptoms may last longer than two weeks. It's a slender curved or spiral gram-negative bacterium with polar flagella. Microaerophilic inhabitants of the small intestine. And it can be found in animals and humans. So moving on to C. diff, Clostridium difficile. It's a gram-positive endospore-forming rod and it's normal biota of the intestine, so it's naturally found there. But if the patient goes on antibiotics and wipes out some of the normal flora, this one can start to overgrow. 
And this one is a spore former, and those spores can land on surfaces and further increase the contamination of the environment. It causes pseudomembranosis um, or membranous colitis, antibiotic associated antibiotic associated colitis. So colitis is just inflammation of the colon. And it's precipitated by therapy with broad spectrum antibiotics. Again, the broad spectrum kind of wipes out a majority of the good guys, leaving this one to overgrow. The enterotoxins A and B cause necrosis in the wall of the intestine, which leads to the profuse watery diarrhea. And that diarrhea can cause a lot of inflammation around the um, anus as well. So treatment withdrawal of antibiotics and replacement of fluids, metronidazole, and then a fecal transplant. Fecal transplant is now being questioned as to whether that's the appropriate uh, route of treatment, but a fecal transplant will directly recolonize the patient with good bacteria. So these are just some pictures you can see of the um, inflammation that can happen and the necrosis that happens from C. diff. Vibrio cholera. So Vibrio cholera causes cholera. It's an incubation period of a few hours to a few days. So once you get this microorganism inside of you, within a couple of hours, you can start to have symptoms of profuse diarrhea. Symptoms begin abruptly with vomiting followed by copious watery feces called secretory diarrhea. You can lose up to one liter of fluid an hour in severe cases. If we think about the blood volume of the average adult male, we've got about five liters of blood. Women, it's even less. Now, you can lose up to one liter of fluid an hour in severe cases. So a fifth of your blood volume of fluid is leaving your body in an hour. You can see how this one can kill people pretty quickly. The loss of blood volume leads to acidosis, potassium depletion, muscle cramps, severe thirst, flaccid skin, and a sunken eyes, which eventually progresses to convulsions and coma, hypotension, tachycardia, cyanosis, and shock. 55 to 70% mortality rate. This is huge. Even with treatment and with fluid replacement, it still has a 55 to 70% mortality rate. This is what it looks like under the microscope. Vibrio means bent rod, so it is a bent rod-shaped microorganism. You get it by contaminated water. That cholera toxin leads to drawing water out of the tissues to flood the toxin out of the digestive tract. So your body responds to the presence of this toxin by trying to flush it out. So it's kind of a good thing that your body's drawing water out of the tissues to flush it out, but it's bad because you're losing all of your fluids in your body. Oral rehydration therapy and antibiotic treatment. So you start the patient on antibiotics and then you do oral rehydration therapy. With oral rehydration therapy, you're taking a tube up the nose and dumping it into the stomach and you're pumping fluids into the center of the intestine. By doing that, you're flushing the toxin out of the body and you're causing kind of a back pressure of water so that water wants to go back into the tissues instead of being forced into the intestine. So the water in the center of the digestive tract has a couple different benefits. And then you're also, of course, going to do IV fluids, but IV fluids are not enough to treat this. You need to combat it with the oral rehydration therapy, antibiotics, and IV fluids. The rotavirus. If you have ever had the stomach flu, it's likely caused by the rotavirus. So double-stranded RNA genome with both inner and outer capsid. Primary cause of morbidity and mortality is resulting from di diarrhea. Two to three million cases per year, 700,000 hospitalizations. It's transmitted by the fecal oral route, including contaminated food, water, and fomites. Fomites is huge here. So fomites, leaving it on any surface. If you have a child that comes home with this, likely everybody in the house is going to get the symptoms within a day. So usually it's a 24-hour type stomach flu. After a day, you usually start feeling better, but everybody can rapidly get this. Now, if you're also sick with something else or immunocompromised in any way, this can last a lot longer, and the dehydration can set you over the edge and actually cause the mortality. Children are treated with oral rehydration therapy. 
And then there's a couple of vaccines that are available for the rotavirus. The norovirus is the most common viral cause of foodborne illness in the United States. So fecal oral transmission or by contaminated food and water, profuse watery diarrhea for three to five days, vomiting happens in the early stages, it has a very low infectious dose, so even one viral particle can make somebody have um, an illness or symptomatic illness. Many outbreaks are associated with um, cruise ships. So this is a table that goes through acute diarrhea with or without vomiting. So here you can see all of these different organisms. So it's one thing to get the infectious pathogen inside of your digestive tract and that pathogen will colonize and release its toxins and cause symptoms from within. Those are treated with antibiotics. But then there's a whole nother type of food poisoning or acute diarrhea infections and this is caused by the toxin being deposited on the surface of your food. When you eat this toxin, you are not getting an infection. The microorganism is not coming into your body. The microorganism is likely dead and it just left its toxin on the surface of your food. A lot of these cases are due to um, storing food at the wrong temperature. So if you let a turkey thaw at room temperature, likely the staff that's on the surface of the turkey is going to be producing toxin and dumping its exotoxin on the surface of the turkey. Then you cook the turkey thoroughly but cooking does not deactivate those toxins. So when you consume the turkey after the fact, then you're going to be consuming purified toxin that's in its regular native form. And it's going to cause the symptoms. The symptoms are always self-limited. So they only last for like eight hours usually. And then you get over it and most people are fine after this. But with most food boy poisoning cases, it's usually just the toxin. Antibiotics are not going to help you if it's just a toxin that's causing the symptoms. So with food poisoning, nausea and vomiting accompanied by diarrhea, um, companions that shared a meal suffer the same fate. Symptoms in the gut are caused by a preformed toxin. Occasionally comes from non-microbial sources such as fish, self shellfish, or mushrooms. Intoxication rather than infection. So that's what I just described. <clears throat> how you're not actually getting an infectious disease, you are getting a toxin that was left behind from an infection. So Staph aureus exotoxin, this is associated with custard, sauces, cream, pastries, processed meats, chicken, salad, or ham. The Staph aureus thrives in the high salt concentration. It releases its toxin, and then that toxin is heat stable and induces the symptoms of cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It onset within one to six hours and recovery completely within 24 hours. This is self-limiting. Antibiotics are not warranted because all it is is toxin on your food. Another one is B. serious or Bacillus serious, the exotoxin. This one is mostly associated with rice, so um, and storing rice at the wrong temperature for long periods of time. Sporulating gram-positive bacterium that lives in the soil. It is the emetic form, which is um, most frequently tied to fried rice that has been cooked and kept warm for long periods of time. Diarrheal form is associated with cooked meats or vegetables held at a warm temperature for long periods of time. Profuse watery diarrhea that lasts about 24 hours. So the toxin again is deposited on the surface of your food. The microorganism has no chance of causing an infection in you. When you eat it, you're eating purified toxin. There's also the C. perfringens toxin. This is also the causative agent of gas gangrene, but when you get gas gangrene, you're getting the microorganism that's infecting you. In this case, this microorganism is just dropping toxin on the surface of your food. It contaminates meat, fish, and vegetables, and beans that have not been cooked properly. Endospores germinate in foods. C. perfringens cells enter the small intestine and release the exotoxin. You get the abdominal pain, diarrhea, and nausea that lasts 8 to 16 hours. It also causes enterocolitis, which is similar to that caused by C. difficile. So 
uh, because of the fact that it's an endospore former and it produces this toxin, a lot of times um, it can be mistaken for C. diff. So these are the details of the three major types of toxins and diarrhea that's caused by the toxin. So this last section I'm going to talk about hepatitis. Hepat is talking about the liver. Itis is inflammation. So when we break apart that word, we see its definition is inflammation of the liver. You have necrosis of hepatocytes or liver cells and a response by mononuclear white blood cells that swells and disrupts the liver architecture. Architecture, sorry. Interferes with excretion of bile pigments and causes bilirubin to accumulate in blood and tissues causing jaundice. So jaundice is yellowing of the skin due to liver failure. If you are destroying your hepatocytes, you're not able to process bilirubin appropriately and shove it into the bile to be released in the digestive tract. So it just accumulates in your tissues and causes the yellowing of the skin. With jaundice, it's most obvious in the whites of the eyes. So if you're not sure if a patient, especially a patient of color, is um, suffering from jaundice, you always look at the whites of the eyes and that will um, kind of give it away. So there's three major types of hepatitis viruses that we're going to discuss in this class. There's actually a lot more that exist, but in this class we're just going to talk about hepatitis A, B, and C. If you have to get hepatitis, hepatitis A is probably the mildest one that you can get. So hepatitis A is the fecal oral, um, the one that causes the digestive tract symptoms. So signs and symptoms are subclinical or vague flu-like symptoms, and then jaundice only happens in about 10% of cases, but it's transmitted by the fecal oral route, and it's associated with deficient personal hygiene and lack of public health measures. Immunizations are available, so you can protect yourself against this, but um, you can get you know, intestinal-like symptoms, and this is shed in the feces. So poor hygiene can transmit hepatitis A. Because the vaccine is out there, if you're vaccinated, you'll never have to get hepatitis A. There is also lifelong immunity with hepatitis A. So whether you've been vaccinated against it or if you've actually had hep A, you should never get it again. So usually once is um, done and then you'll never get it again. Hepatitis B. So hepatitis B is an envelope DNA virus. Signs and symptoms include fever, chills, malaise, anorexia, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, nausea, rashes, and arthritis may occur and causes hepatocellular carcinoma. In other words, causes liver cancer. So hepatitis B has the potential to cause liver cancer. It's transmitted by tiny amounts of blood. So this is uh, one of the more common methods of transmission that goes unnoticed often is sexual transmission. So this can be transmitted sexually and then any type of contact with blood. An effective vaccine is available. So if you get vaccinated, you'll never have to worry about Hep B. When you're a baby, they give you three shots. One of them's usually like right at birth. So within a day of the baby being born, they get their first um, round of hepatitis B and then they get two boosters. And then later on in life, if you're gonna go work in healthcare, they, some of them require that you get the Hep B vaccine before you're allowed to handle patients. Hepatitis C is known as the silent epidemic. So with this one, you can be asymptomatic for 60 plus years and not know that you have hepatitis C. If you ever go donate blood, they test you for this, and that's usually how people end up finding out that they have hepatitis C. They have some random blood draw and they did some test, and just by chance they happen to find out that they have it. Signs and symptoms, once they begin, are similar to hepatitis B. 75 to 85% remain infected indefinitely, although now there is a cure. So there is a cure for hepatitis C now. Transmission and epidemiology, so blood transfusions, needle sharing, you have to have direct blood contact with hepatitis C. Treatment, there's no vaccine available for hep C, but there is now a um, cure for hep C. So there's a combination drug that does cure it. So a little story about hepatitis C. A friend of mine's dad all of a sudden developed liver failure. 
He went to the doctor and um, the liver failure was accompanied by liver cancer. So he was in very early stages of liver cancer and when he was diagnosed, they said that he had hepatitis C. Now thinking back on his history, they wondered if he ever, you know, shared needles or had blood contact with anybody. My friend's dad was a police officer for many years and he retired from um, the police uh, force and remembers a day about 25 years prior that this man and him were fighting and he was trying to arrest the man and the man had um, chipped a tooth in his mouth and there was a lot of blood in the guy's mouth and the guy spit in my friend's dad's face during the arrest. So my friend's dad um, immediately got the prophylactic treatment for HIV and hepatitis B but didn't really think about hepatitis C and back then when this happened about um, 35 years ago now that this wasn't really commonly thought of so didn't think anything of it never got tested for hep C and all of a sudden just presented with these symptoms of liver failure from an incident that happened likely 25 years prior so this had absolutely no symptoms for 25 years and then all of a sudden sudden onset of liver failure and liver cancer got treated He's fully recovered from this and now he's cured from hepatitis C. But it was really scary for a while. Before they had a cure, they just gave supportive treatments and did the best that they could to try to treat the cancer. He had to have part of his liver removed and uh, they monitored to make sure that this hadn't progressed or metastasized anywhere in his body and now he's doing perfectly fine. But this one, although it's very similar to hepatitis B, it is not known to be transmitted sexually. This one requires direct blood contact, and this one can be asymptomatic for a really long time. So this is a breakdown table of hepatitis A, B, and C.